In the headlines, the Director of Public Prosecution hires a special team to prosecute the Chief Elections Officer. The small community of Quebana goes on lockdown as Region 1 sees a spike in COVID-19 cases. But the Health Minister says new interventions could see a drop in two weeks. Once you put those measures in place, um, within two weeks to three weeks, you would see the number of cases going down. The Minister of Public Works says no contractor will get a monopoly on government contracts. And in sport, a surprise shepherd looking to cement a spot in the West Indies team after call-up to replace Bravo. With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. The Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, has hired a special team to prosecute Chief Elections Officer Keith Lowenfield on the charges that he engaged in fraud and seeking to have APNU plus FC declared the winners of the March 2nd polls when in fact the PPP won 15,000 more votes. The DPP has hired prominent attorneys Glenn Hanuman and Sanjeev Datatin, along with four others to prosecute the case. Lowenfield faces three charges of misconduct in public office and three charges of forgery. Lowenfield's attorney, Nigel Hughes, criticized the move, saying the trial would not be fair because Datadin is a member of parliament for the ruling PPP. He said prosecutors have a duty to the court and under the Legal Practitioners Act to be fair and with Datadin's prosecution, this could affect a fair trial. But Datadin's had questions regarding his political association are mainly red herring since Hughes is also associated with the opposition political coalition and was in fact the one who started the argument that 33 was not a majority in the 65-seat National Assembly and this led to a drawn-out political process. The DPP decided to hire the team to prosecute the charges against Lowenfield after she decided to drop the private criminal charges against him and proceed with the charges developed by the police. Lowenfield was notified of this when he appeared before Magistrate Sherdell Isaacs on Friday morning. Meanwhile, Hughes wants the matter to be tried and determined in the High Court by a 12-member jury. For that to happen, the Magistrate will have to determine that a case has been made out, much like a preliminary inquiry in murder cases, and then send the matter to the High Court. He said the allegation is that Guyana was defrauded and as a result it would be most appropriate for 12 citizens instead of one magistrate to hear and determine the case but Datadin insisted that the case is a straightforward one that can be heard and decided on by the magistrate he said the case is uncomplicated and a criminal one and should be treated as such Datadin argued that the magistrate can determine guilt and innocence and the magistrate can do the trial fairly and quickly. Lowenfield came under scrutiny for preparing his elections report on March 5th, which included inflated figures presented to him by Claremont Mingo, the returning officer for Guyana's largest voting district. If Mingo's report was used, the country would have been cheated of the real victors of the elections, the PPP, and instead David Granger and his coalition would have been sworn in for a second term. Lowenfield would have known who the true winner of the elections was since he received all of the original statements of poll from the country's polling stations. A health response team will be sent to Region 1 to assist with a recent spike of COVID-19 cases there. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony made the announcement during an update on the COVID-19 situation in the country. According to the minister, the government was able to control the high number of cases in the other regions through mass testing and strict adherence to the COVID-19 guidelines. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 health crisis in Guyana, Region 1 has recorded a total of 626 cases to date. As of October 21st, there were 101 active cases in the region and 24 persons died. For October so far, Guyana has recorded 35 COVID-19 deaths, of which 9 are from Region 1. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony, during a COVID update, said a health response team was sent to assist regional health workers with a new spike in cases in the region. The number of new cases has been reported due to mass testing. Dr. Anthony said once effective COVID-19 measures are implemented, there should be a decrease in positive cases. Once you put those measures in place, um, within two weeks to three weeks, you would see the number of cases going down because we have had similar experiences with other villages and we know this, uh, these methods that we are using have really worked and worked very well. So we are employing those same techniques 
uh, in Quibana and some of the other affected areas. The health minister further explained that the other regions have been doing well in containing the disease. At times there are little spikes and then once all the public health measures uh, are put in place, uh, you would see a slowing uh, of transmission. Uh, so while the, na the national average uh, would be going up, when you disaggregate it by different regions, you would see that uh, regions, uh, quite a few regions are doing very well. Meanwhile, Dr. Anthony also revealed that regional hospitals across the country now have enough beds and ventilators to treat COVID-19 patients who need hospitalization. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isana Lopato. Meanwhile, Corbana, a small village in the Maruka sub-district in Region 1, will go on full lockdown from Sunday. The lockdown will last for two weeks, the villagers Tushau Paul Pierre told the newsroom during a telephone interview on Friday. The Tushau said the lockdown is necessary and will help curb the spike in COVID-19 cases in the village. Already two persons have died and there are over 50 positive cases in the village. The Tushau for Quebana village in Region 1 said there are over 50 positive COVID-19 cases. Tushau Paul Pierre and his wife tested positive on October 13th and he spoke with the newsroom via telephone just as he was leaving isolation on Friday. With a recent increase in positive cases from the village, the village council took the decision to go into complete lockdown for two weeks with hopes that it will contain the spread of the deadly disease. There will be limited to no movements of community members within the community and no one will be allowed to leave or enter the village. Kubana, we, we will be going into a lockdown from, from Sunday, um, a complete lockdown because the, the cases keep rising. For how long? Um, for, for 14 days, uh, according to the, the health authorities and the, the other regional officials, we, we have to go into, into a lockdown for 14 days. The Tushau explained that food supplies are being sent from Mabaruma to assist persons during the lockdown. Health workers stationed at Santa Rosa will also travel 22 miles to do checkups at Quebana because there is limited health workers in the village. The Tushau further explained that there is also no isolation facilities in the village as such positive patients are treated in Santa Rosa. We are, we are being um, assisted by, by the regional administration. To, um, Actually, I think some food relief is on its way to Cabana right now from Mabaruma. Um, the security-wise, the police will, will also be um, present, to have a presence in, in the community. Um, but I think it's necessary right now. Quibana is home to some 900 persons. The Tushau is further calling for additional support from the government during the lockdown. Yeah, well, I think it, 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 uh, it, uh, it more or less uh, an, uh, an issue, uh, and it should be a national health issue. And whatever support we, we can get from government, from any other organization, I, I think we, we would appreciate it. Um, sanitizers, masks, um, those are some of the things that I think we, we, we really need now in the community because the situation is that we need to we need to sanitize the entire community. Um, people people need to you know don't make, don't make masks an excuse. Um, so so we, we need we need those support. All the villages in Region One with positive cases include Manawari, Red Hill, and Blackwater. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isana Lopato. Police Commissioner Nigel Hoppy on Friday received 2,000 masks and a check valued at $99,000 from the Private Sector Commission to protect police officers from COVID-19. According to the Commission of Police, the funds will be used to purchase cloth and other materials to sew reusable masks for the police ranks who are part of the government's COVID curb operation. The handing over was done at the Commissioner's Conference Room, Eve Leary, by Chairman of the Private Sector Commission, Nicholas Boyer, and President of the Ghana Oil and Gas Energy Chamber, Manuel Prashad. As we know, um, Operation Scoby Curve was recently launched, and in collaboration with the Ghana Defense Force, the Ghana Police Force has continued to work together with that organization as a team for us in the first instance to sensitize members of the community of the importance of them adhering to the measures that are in place. So we need to engage, encourage, educate, and then enforce. We've been doing that, and we only hope that people will continue to adhere to the uh, measures that are in place. So we would like to express thanks in a big way 
for this donation, this timely donation that we're going to receive today, not only for our ranks who are going about their business routinely on a day-to-day basis, but more importantly, those frontline ranks who are engaged in the operations and those who are in the regions as part of the task force that are on board the locations. We are also thankful because we have seen instances where members of society, members of the public reported to the police stations to make complaints and they were without masks. So once we have that, we also ensure that they are able to have a mask whenever they are making a report. Responsible members of the population, then we have a few members of the population that maybe we need to help to educate what the risks of COVID-19 are. Uh, the second part of, of what I'd like to say is that we want to encourage members of the public to respect and work with the police force on the public health ordinance. COVID-19 is a very serious pandemic that is affecting the world. And I think now we're into millions of deaths worldwide. And in Guyana, we're above 3,000 cases. We'd encourage all members of the population to follow the guidelines as set by the Ministry of Public Health, as well as the international agencies such as the WHO and PAHO, and to wear your mask and social distance. So there's more news ahead on the newsroom. Stay with us. You're watching the newsroom. New contractors will be given the opportunity to conduct works in every sector to ensure that no contractor has a monopoly. This is according to Minister of Public Works Juan Agil, who, along with Minister Deodat Indar, engaged contractors at the Archidong Conference Center earlier this week. Several road contractors had their concerns addressed this week during an engagement with Public Works Ministers Juan Agil and Deodat Indar. Agil, in remarks to the contractors, assured that there will be no discrimination against any firm. He said each contractor, old and new, will be given projects in each sector. I intend to ensure that new entrants must be allowed in every sector of Guyana's development. Nobody will get a monopoly or control a sector. It's dangerous. We have to allow new entrants. The meeting was held at the Arta Chong Conference Center. There, the contractors raised concerns, including the misuse of roads, the variation in project costs, among other issues. Sometimes when the NDC go and clean the drains, the, the, the debris and the, the dirt that they take off from the, the ditches, they place it on the road shoulder, so the water could not escape and go anywhere when the rain falls. It stays on the road. When the residents is building house, or they're doing an upgrade of the the place, they throw the sand right on the roadside and have it there for weeks. So we have to now divert away from that. So they start hitting the, the, the clay blankets on the road edge and start to break in and come into the road. To the roadway, as mentioned by the contractor, you have trucks that are parked on the roadway when they are finished. Now, the, I think the maximum roadway within, within the schemes, I think about what, 12 foot wide, right? Now, they should be, they could be advantage of having the 12 foot wide. You can use it as a one-way traffic rather than having the two-way traffic where people have to run on the shoulders. And it has, in that sense, an added security within that area. But the next thing fundamentally, which I want to advise the Ministry of Works, that we should start looking at how we construct or the building with our shoulders, which as you know, give the road lateral support. And that's one of the fundamental things I think we need to look at is in the construction of our shoulders. Those in attendance to the meeting were told to do better to ensure that projects are completed on time. They were also urged to engage the ministry to have their issues addressed on a frequent basis since delayed projects also affect citizens. Additionally, the Ministry of Public Works said it will grant certification for providers of raw construction materials to ensure compliance with established standards. Chief Works Officer Mr. Jeffrey Vaughan made this disclosure following concerns raised by contractors that owners of loom and quarry pits sometimes shortchange them by providing subpar materials. Bibi Katoon, Newsroom. Two brothers from Rosignol, West Coast Burbis, remain hospitalized two weeks after being severely burnt about their bodies with hot oil during an altercation with other villagers. 
euro. Four days, Turte and his younger brother, 24-year-old Jason Carpenters, are hospitalized with intense pain at the Fort Wellington Hospital. One of their sisters, Karen Fordyce, told the newsroom that on October 11, the family was alerted that the suspects who lived two streets away were assaulting Jason. As a result, Ural rushed to his assistance and after managing to get his brother away, while walking away, they were doused with hot oil. The reason for the attack remains unclear, but the sisters explained that the suspects would usually engage in fights with other villagers. On the, on the 11th of October, Around 7.30 time, yes. What happened exactly? My, um, uh, one of my younger brother, he was, um, he was passing by in, in, the, in the street and I was made to understand that some people were attacking him or whatever, so someone ran to and told my mother because she was sitting down in the street corner. They were telling her, they were screaming and telling her that someone is murdering or someone is trying to kill her son. So she called out, she ran to, ran to his rescue to go see what's going on. She called, called out to my big brother and my second brother. He heard too, so he ran out too. And they both went there to find out from the people what was going on. So when they were ready to find out about find what was going on, the people them cussing up and going on, so they were turning to come away. After they weren't talking nicely to my mother and my brothers, they turned away. When they turned away now, they had um pots and cups and flour with substance and they poured it on my brothers them. And they're in the hospital. What about their injuries? Where and where they receive burns? On their back and arms, belly, yeah. Who are the people who attack them? Are these are these villagers or? Yes, they, we are all from the same village and so on. Do you know why or? I don't know. And um, is the police doing an investigation? Well, so far the police hasn't told us anything. They're just taking statements from people from our side and they have been placing them on bail and so on and they haven't come to tell us if they arrested, they arrested the people in or I don't know, nothing of the sort. How many persons attack them, if you could say? It's, it's, it's four of them. Okay, how are your brothers doing? Uh, well, actually they're, they're there. They're healing, yes, but they're having a lot of pain, and uh, they're there. What did they do before? Where did they work? Uh, my big brother is Euro. He's um, he's work. He's a carpenter work, and my next brother, he does the same thing too. Okay. Any of them have any children? My big brother has four children, and he have a, he had a, a son in August. A baby was born in August, a new baby. So four kids, he have three daughters and da it's a boy. He was born in August. We're waiting, they're saying that, I don't know, we're waiting on the police. We're looking after the boys in the hospital and we're waiting on the police them to tell us what, what is the next move. We're, we're praying and hoping that justice is served. Guyanese psychotherapist and life coach Shane Tull is urging stakeholders in the private and public sectors to get serious about national healing and reconciliation. He stands ready to offer his expertise in whatever way he can and has already crafted a plan that he hopes to get the much needed support to roll out. Tull in an interview with the newsroom talks about the need for confronting painful discussions as the first step in the process. I do believe that in my experience, you know, I am Guyanese, I've been coming there all my life in the last four to five years. I've, I've spent a tremendous amount of time there. So I'm very familiar with the, with the, the political, the socio-political climate of Guyana. And I really believe that after the lead up to the election and after the election of all the things that has happened, I think it has really tear the fabric of our country part and I it, for me it's very sad I think we need to be responsible and recognize what has happened 
really pay attention to how can we have reconciliation. Because at, at the core of who we are, we are a peaceful people. We're very good about relating and supporting each other. And, you know, our, our core motto is one people, one nation, one destiny. And we cannot achieve those things if we are polarized. So I, my proposal is really about bringing stakeholders to the table in a way that we can provide a sense of healing, a sense of restoration, a sense of reconciliation, and how do we move forward in building the country and meet, meeting the potential that we foresee three years ago with, with the advent of oil. I think that we're in this unique place to be uh, an example of an example of the region in the region of how our political and social disagreement, but still be able to come to the table and find space for everyone and promote nationalism. We're Guyanese. We are we are entrenched in and the healing of our country. And we cannot just say those words. We have to be committed to the process. So bringing private and government sectors to the table and really allowing open discussion and holding space for healing and being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because these are heavy discussions. They are, they are painful. They are aged old discussions. And we are, when we're in fear, we can rely on the things that our grandparents told us about another set of people. And I, in, in the younger generation, in my experience in, in coming to Guyana and dealing with, with people there, I, I didn't experience or I, or I didn't see what I've seen within the last six months there. And that is disheartening, but I really think as someone that loves the country and cares about people, anything that I can do in using my professional expertise, I'm more than willing to offer it. Thank you very much. Can you say if you've reached out to anyone as yet with this proposal and what has the response been like? Hey, this is just, I, it's just something I've been thinking, I've been thinking about. I pro I proposed it. I reached out to the Ministry of uh, Social Cohesion, and I got a response that it was the the letter was received, and they will follow up. But so far, that's that's been it. But this is just something that I sat and I thought about, and so you know, I, I I'll just put it out there and and see it and see how what the responses are and how I can lend my support to the initiative. And for someone for, from the private sector listening to this currently um, and want to know exactly how they can become involved, how exactly can they become involved and contact information for you and stuff like that? Well, also, I, I really think that it's just not about contacting me. I think it's about coalescing around the idea and bringing stakeholders together. Like you can think of the civic and religious organizations, I think there are, there are a, an, impar an impartial body. And I really think that to start from there and enlist the support of the private sector and the government sector and really have a new initiative of, in terms of healing Guyana. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with support. Welcome back, you're watching Newsroom. It's time to take a look at sport and we start off with cricket. Romario Shepard was surprised he got the call to replace mentor Dwayne Bravo in the West Indies T20 squad for next month's tour to New Zealand. The Caribbean side played the host in three T20s followed by two test matches. The 25-year-old wants to use the opportunity to further establish himself as an international cricketer. He spoke to Akeem Green. Back in the West Indies setup once again, Romario, you must be elated with this call up, especially what looms ahead in 2021. Yeah, I'm happy with the call up, you know. Um, 
bit surprised at the first, but then, you know, unfortunately, Dwayne got injured and, you know, they say I was in, so I was happy when I got that call. You know, Dwayne was the guy who gave you your cup when you first played your first T20 international. I guess mm -hmm. it must be quite mixed emotions are replacing the guy who gave you a cup and, and he's out injured and you're into the squad. You know, um, he's someone that I've looked up to over the years, you know, and uh, um, and not just, you know, that I'm in the Caribbean, you know, he opened the door for them. I you know I looked up I looked up to him a lot during the years, you know, looking what he do and everything, follow him step by step. And, you know, I was happy in the first place, you know, to receive my cup from him. And, you know, it's unfortunate the game that, you know, he's the one that missed it out for me. You know, you look back at the CPL, uh, you've been ever improving. I think this year, I won't say you mastered it, but you've really gotten better at your ability to bowl in the depth. Uh, you know, is that something you really want to put on show here in New Zealand if we get an opportunity to play? Yeah, obviously, you know, um, at the depth, you know, win over the years, over the past. Last couple of seasons, you know, I was in the team with him. You know, that team went to that um, against Ireland. You know, he showed me a lot. So, um, when I was home during the current time, you know, whenever I get the chance, you know, the ball, I actually work on new stuff. And, you know, yeah, it's something that he told me that no matter who you are at the depth, you know, it's hard to get hit whenever you nail it. Yeah. So, I work on it very hard. You know, I showed improvement during the T20 and um, the CPL. For you, Romario, given the uncertainty of what lies ahead in 2021 in terms of, I know there's a lot of tours initially planned, but we don't know if all will come off. You know, how big a tour is in Zealand for you in terms of, I guess, putting your name in the selector's mind for that spot from India 2021, the World 20 defense? Well, for me, I'm not looking back straight to next year. I'm looking at this 3 20 coming up. So, they're not looking too far ahead, but you know, I'm looking just to capitalize on this this tour. You know, get some performances because you know, doing this summer, whenever you feel better, he will be back in the squad. So I need to just get the performances so that whenever he come back, you know, it must be a juggle whether they're gonna leave me out or not again. There's a lot of talk about the bubble and how players are, are finding it a bit mentally toxic. I know you were there in Trinidad and Tobago, one team, with one hotel. Could you give us some, some comments on how you found being in the bubble? You know, it's hard for the first couple of days, and you know, you just have to find that thing to keep your body going, keep yourself, keep your mind going, because mainly it's your mind that is play with. So you have to keep something, you know, think about your family, what you do, find time to get a little work in and stuff like that. You know, during the first couple of days, whenever you can, can't really go to the next teammate room or you can't go to practice. So you're just in your room like, on a lockdown. So it actually builds your mind more, so it's a more mental, mental state for me. And, you know, you have to be mentally tough. You know, I don't know how much you know, but West Indies have informed uh, touring to New Zealand very friendly over the last couple of years. A lot of matches lost. Looking at your teammates, knowing your potential, knowing your teammates' potential, given most of them would have played in the CPL, what are you thinking of your chances as you head over there to New Zealand for these three matches? Well, you know, West Indies have always played well in T20 cricket, so, um, and also the test series, so we are also back in the test, guys, so I think the test guys been performing well. So, and the T20 guys, you know, just coming out of the tour of, um, of Sri Lanka, so we need to go there and just believe in ourselves and don't look back at the past, just believe in whatever we have in front of us and go work with it, go win some games and stuff like that, get, get a confidence back into the, into the team and into the setup going forward. And finally, the Chief Selector Roger Harper had stated that the 18 matches will comprise of obviously this, some of the test reserves and you guys in the 20 squad. You know, there's a lot of talk about persons using that, those two 18 matches to I guess be an addition for test cricket. You yourself had mentioned you want to play test cricket. So I'm certain you're gonna to want to play those four-day matches and do well. Yeah, I'm looking forward for that challenge. You know, four-day cricket is something that I enjoy playing over the years and I've had some success in four-day cricket. 
So I'm looking forward for this, you know, if I get an opportunity, you know, to go out there and show what I can do. And hopefully, you know, they, they can give me that chance. That's it for me, Neil Marks. Here's the rest of the sport news with Avinash Ramzan. We tell you now that Cricket West Indies has tentative plans to have international cricket return to the Caribbean as early as the first quarter of 2021. However, according to the president, Ricky Skerritt, the bugbear is ironing out where best they can have the biosecure environment. Akim Green reports. The International Cricket Council featured tour schedule list Sri Lanka for a tour to the Caribbean in February-March 2021 which consists of two tests, three one-day internationals and three T20s. Skerritt told Sports Max TV in a recent interview they are producing a draft schedule for regional international cricket. The, the, the first regional cricket that, that we're proposing is uh, next year, the, the, the Super 50, um, at the end of January. So we, we're not proposing any, any regional cricket. We're not, we're not hosting any international cricket before, um, I think it's Sri Lanka, forgive me, I don't have the details in my fingertips here, but which will be uh, around um, February or somewhere. We go to, we go to, to, uh, to Bangladesh in January, February, and then we, we have three teams coming, spread more towards this summer rather than the early part of the year. We have Sri Lanka, South Africa, and Australia. So we hope to, to publish all of that, Lance, in, in the next uh, couple of weeks as we begin to fine-tune um, venues and so on. The Caribbean Premier League was played to great success in a bubble as odd players and officials stayed at one hotel in Trinidad and Tobago and matches were held at two venues. No confirmed cases of COVID-19 was reported from any player or official. The problem is where is suited to host where can we create the protocols, including the biosecure bubble that we spoke about? And, and so a number of changes have to be looked at, a number of options. But at the local level, we just, we just listened to the presidents of the various territorial boards speak about their efforts to restart local cricket. And I'm happy to say that in certainly more than half of the territories, local cricket is at least preparation, net sessions, academies, um, uh, practice sessions for, for the franchises and so on, uh, is beginning. Another issue lies with traveling within the region and the varying restrictions some countries have in place. In terms of regional air transport and the ability to move players around and deal with the, 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 the restrictions, it's, that, that is not something that we could look towards for at least until about the, the end of the, towards the end of the first quarter next year is what we're hoping. World Olympians Association Executive Committee member Alien Pompey says athletes must recognize and grab the opportunities that are available outside of competing. Pompey, the four-time Guyanese Olympian, got the nod to serve on the association this week and highlighted the avenues for growth even after those competitive days are over. It's always with pride and joy that I represent the Golden Arrowhead. So I think for us as a nation um, to now have someone on World Olympians Association, the IOC, Athletes Commission, the Pan Am Sports Athletes Commission and the Pan Am Sports Executive Board um, where I'm not only a member, but so is Mr. Juman um, Yassin. He's also a member of the executive board there. So I, I think that there's definitely a pattern um, of Guyanese people kind of um, doing well um, in sports, inter uh, sports administration internationally. And I hope our athletes see this as, as a way, uh, as, as noticing that there's other opportunities um, available outside of sports. Um, doing this has been an opportunity for me to continue to do what I love, um, which is be around track and field and be around sports in other capacities. So I think it's, it's good in that sense. 
Um, and I look forward to, again, to working with everyone and ensuring that the success of the region is shared within all the, all the countries and um, stakeholders. Chennai Super Kings are effectively out of this year's IPL, having been soundly beaten by a rampant Mumbai Indians in Sharjah on Friday. Batting first, Chennai were reduced at 21 for 5 in the power play and at 43 for 7, they were in danger of scoring the lowest total in the history of the IPL. However, Sam Curran batted diligently to score 52 of 47 balls to give the Super Kings something to work with as they posted 114 for 9. Trent Bolt picked up 4 for 18, Jasper Bumrah 2 for 25 and Rahul Chahar 2 for 22. Mumbai Indians, led by Kiran Pollard in the absence of the injured Rohit Sharma, rumped to a massive 10 wicket win in 12.2 overs. Ishan Kishan, opening the batting in the absence of Sharma, blasted 5 sixes and 6 fours in 68 of 37, while the informed Quinton de Kock played second fiddle with 46 not out of 37. The win took Mumbai Indians to pole position, while Super Kings' eighth defeat in 11 matches has kept them in the seller position. IPL action continues this weekend with four matches. On Saturday, Kolkata Knight Riders play Delhi Capitals at 6 hours and Kings 11 Punjab take on Sunrisers Hyderabad at 10 hours. On Sunday, Royal Challengers Bangalore are up against Chennai Super Kings at 6 hours, while at 10 hours is Rajasthan Royals versus Mumbai Indians. And with that, we have come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.